Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning if you're on the other side of the world. Thanks for joining me today. Um, for, oops, I, hang on, just need to turn off that audio monitor or you're going to hear me twice. Um, uh, so again, thanks for joining uh, wherever you may be in the world. Today is uh, a nice, easy one for me because I'm going to have uh, two special guests, which uh, I shall introduce shortly. Before we get to that, I'm going to turn off uh, the snow before I forget. So it's uh, pretty chilly down here and across the rest of the world and we're moving into holiday season so I thought that would be a nice touch. Uh, for those of you on YouTube and Facebook if you want to add a comment uh, you're more than welcome so please if you put a comment in on YouTube and Facebook that will come straight through to me and the guests Ian and Ava who we'll meet in a second. If you're in our uh, webinar room just make sure you use the Q&A tab uh, that just separates out the questions uh, from the main chat and you'll find the Q&A tab over on the right. So I will keep an eye on those and uh, send those over to uh, Jan and Ava when we get to it. So let's go ahead and find uh, our guests. Hey guys, how are you doing? Hi. Hey. Hey, so uh, we have Jan up the top. Sorry, um, need to, um, my camera's reversed, so I can't quite point in the right. <laughs> um, those of you who've joined uh, live stream before will uh, know Jan very well. He's one of our Capture On Ambassadors, uh, a retoucher based out of Germany. And then new uh, to our live stream today is Arva Pivo. Hi, Arva. How are you doing? Hi, hi. Good. And oh, Arva, I'm good. <laughs> Arva is currently based in uh, Berlin, soon to be uh, Italy in the near future, which sounds fantastic. And um, both Arva and I are suffering from various different ailments. Um, so uh, we will try not to cough and hack our way through uh, uh, through this live stream. But we're getting better, so we're getting there. So um, first of all, Jan and Arva, for, for those who don't know you, perhaps you can each of you can give... Uh, your five second or oh, sorry 30 second introduction and we'll start with Jan. With me? Okay. Yeah, with uh, you. Well. <laughs> All right then. Uh, hello everybody. I'm Jan. I'm a retouch artist based in uh, Düsseldorf, Germany and I'm collaborating closely with uh, photographers such as Ava for example. We create a lot of beauty and fashion work together and I also work a lot with uh, advertising agencies or clients directly. I'm specialized in beauty uh, hair, fashion and commercial and I'm doing that for quite some time now so it's almost my 20th year in uh, in, in retouching and um, I'm very happy to be part of the Capture One Ambassador program and uh, engage with you uh, to share knowledge and motivation and I'm uh, thrilled for this webinar. Fantastic and um, actually Alba, I've got your website so let's switch to have a look at your work. Perfect. So perhaps you can talk us through the kind of work you do as well. And I'll just randomly pick some, uh, some stories <laughs> yeah, over you here. Can. Yeah. <laughs> so pick some or whatever you want. I'm, I'm Ava, I'm photographer, mainly working in beauty and fashion, sometimes also focused a little bit more on portrait stuff. Um, yeah, I'm mostly working normally in New York. Um, but after the pandemic, some things changed mm -hmm. for a lot of people of us, I think, for sure. Um, so I'm now starting to work a little bit more in Germany and also more, a little bit focused more on the parts of Europe, like Italy and uh, maybe France in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you see something for, um, I think it was... So for L, Elf I think, Elf yes, yeah. yeah, it was Elf Force. Uh, it's it's uh, some years ago, so I'm not remembering everything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I'm working on my website, so I was first thinking, oh, it's so good to show my website because I only have really a few things at the moment mm -hmm. on it because I'm really want to um, show in the future not too much work because finally the most people see something before and. Um, you can go more nearly into it to send portfolios out, but I want to show some, uh, only a few spots for the future here. Definitely. Yeah, so I'm working um, since, uh, I think now I met Jan one, one year ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and um, over the last months, we are really working really close. Uh, and... And um, it was really, a, oh, no, fun. My, my monitor is doing a <laughs> color correction. <laughs> per perfect. Um, so, okay, when I'm looking funny, it's uh, sorry. 
it's soon over. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, we have a really interesting and nice um, way to collaborate with each other. And um, I learned over the last few months um, in our work together how important it is to really be a team and how Absolutely. much fun it can be to work directly near to your retouch artist. Yeah, so we will share a little bit more about it, I think, through the session today. Yeah, absolutely. So what the plan is, is that um, uh, we've got a couple of different editorials that uh, Jan is going to edit uh, using a couple of different uh, techniques. And as I said, if, uh, you know, we obviously welcome the interaction. Uh, so um, if you have your questions, then please don't hesitate to ask. So. Yeah, and let's bring up your screen and let's we we'll stick with the three of us for a second. Uh, let's go for that one so we're not hiding the picture. And then this is our first editorial. So Arva, maybe you want to tell us a, a, a little bit about um, what was behind this shoot and, and what you had to do. Yeah, so th this was a shooting for Numero Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Um, and we had a really special task on this evening because we had only around one and a half hour to shoot a complete editorial okay, with two models. So pretty pressured then. Yeah, it was a little bit tight. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the, the bigger pressure was really that um, we before discussed that we want to do that on the water mm -hmm. and that we want to have something like a beach, a little bit, this atmosphere of a little water wooden beach uh, thing and i only remember the place at the dock beach where i'm always walking there's one um lake here in berlin where you can let the dogs running free um okay. it's the only area or bigger area and real wood area where you can let the dogs without leashes um, and so we decided to go there and i didn't thought about how it would be to have maybe 100 dogs around us when we only have <laughs> one and a half hour time and of course yeah. normally there are only dogs and people but nothing has happened right. so the dogs asked thought we are really cool because we do something else and we had all the clothings with us and every dog want to sniff <laughs> at the clothing and it's so and wide to, right <laughs> yeah, yeah and want to say hello and my mm -hmm. makeup artist she can't work because she need always stand next to our clothings because a lot of the dogs maybe want to set a mark on it mm -hmm. so it was really interesting and, and our stylist he was so nervous because you can see here in this picture it was a really special outfit it's uh, from louis vuitton and it's really the last outfit uh, virtual abelo designed for Louis Vuitton before he died. Okay. Um, so and he was, it was a special thing for him that he could use it from Paris directly. Um, and he was so nervous because it was white and all the dirt <laughs> and all the dogs. <laughs> and he was really, so it was, I had my old dog with me and she was next to our clothing area. So she was protecting it and mm -hmm. was uh, gelling at all other dogs. Like <laughs> it's my place, go away. Uh, but finally, we had a lot of fun here. Yeah, and it was fine. The, the problem was um, for me with the pictures, it was blue hour. So yeah. maybe you see it later. It was really and with we had two models, both boys, both really dark skin. So it's not so easy to to handle it with the shadows and um, with all the blue light is coming around you. Mm -hmm. So it was really thankful to have Jan on board for it and uh, managing it later on to bring it to nice, a little bit warmer colors. Yeah, so I think it's up to Jan to show what was he's doing with it. Yes. Yes, but I have to say these are unretouched yet. So I'm mm. you did a really good job in keeping all the dogs away, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't do anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's very clean. Yeah. Yes. So um, yes, it's it's uh, I can say the same. It's it's always good to, you know, um, have this kind of interaction and partnership with photographers, uh, especially such as Ava, because she's completely open to bounce ideas and thoughts. And what we love to do is like to interact live all the time as much as we can. And therefore, we always uh, whenever we can, we also use Capture One Live because then I can uh, be part of the shoot, even if I'm not in Berlin or where Ava is at that very moment in space and time. And um, so this is really, really handy for us to have uh, our workflow going. And um, that being said, uh, this one, um, we had the idea of bringing it to 
a nice warm uh, color palette and uh, work a little bit on the contrast. As Ava already said, there was some um, some some shadows that we wanted to lift a bit so that the the skin is beautifully lit and uh, we can recover a bit of the shadows. And for this editorial, I would just give you a little overview of the of the images that we picked. As you can see, um, there is um, quite some some shadows in here and uh, the bluish tones in the whites, and uh, that is what we want to work and play with and bring it to, uh, as I said, really nice uh, color scheme that uh, complements um, the dress as well and uh, brings it to that moody atmosphere that Ava was having in her vision. And um, to achieve this, I want to um, create one master look for, that's how I usually work with uh, editorials uh, or a series of images. I always create one master. And from there, um, we decide that this is going to be the, the final look. Um, and then we um, apply it to all the others uh, in the series. And in this case, uh, we would just start. And uh, usually I have uh, everything I need in my uh, quick menu. As you can see, there's a lot because I don't want to switch all the time. I have the things that I need in, in every image right here. And then there's this scrolling menu that I love to use for all the settings that uh, are more or less optional, like grain and noise reduction and sharpening and clarity, so on. But I will walk you through that as we go. And um, what I always do in the beginning is work with the white balance. And in this case, um, there needed to be uh, quite a big shift. So to bring it uh, somewhere close to, to maybe yeah, something like this, five, seven, five, eight, somewhere there. And um, I want to uh, bring the, the, the colors a bit more uh, to, the, to the green side. But I will, as, as I go, you will see that I um, do step by step. And by, by using these tiny little steps, I can achieve the look that I want. And I don't have to do it with one slider. I, I make a lot of use of all the color tools available in Capture One. And my main uh, tools are the curves and the, the color editor, as uh, you will see. And um, so the next thing that I want to do is bring a little contrast in. Um, maybe just as such. And um, my, my go-to tool uh, in playing with uh, luminosity is definitely the high dynamic range. Uh, it, had a, it has a lot of power now with um, being able to not only work with shadows and, and uh, lights, but you can also use the highlights and uh, the blacks. I guess that was the switch a couple of versions ago, right? I... Um, so yeah, so what was added was whites and blacks. So that's the, if you like, the extreme ends of the, uh, of the histogram. So that just gives you a little bit more uh, control over the very darkest areas and very brightest areas. So yeah, it's a, it's a huge help. Yes. So what I, what I do is um, here, as you can see, trying to balance out uh, the luminosity values a bit so that we have a little bit more contrast. And um, I opened the shadows, I darkened the blacks, that brings a little more contrast in. And um, I like to have this as a, as a starting point. And it's not set in stone what I do here. It's usually my usual workflow is just, you know, being very creative and playful with it. These are my tools and I, it's not, a, as I said, it's not put in stone. So it, you can um, be flexible with it, but this is a good starting point for me. And now um, I love to work with the curves in all its facets. So I like playing with the RGB curve, which is basically addressing all channels. And I like to go into the individual channels to play with colors as well. And um, I know that many people don't use curves as much, especially in channels. But in this um, session here today, I would love to um, like invite you to explore it a bit and show you the, the beautiful benefits it gives you. And um, so let's start with the RGB curve. Um, I want to just bring in a slightly more contrast by, um, by bringing in a slight S curve, something um, maybe around this 
it's a very little nudge, but uh, the curve is very powerful. So a little nudge already does a lot. And um, I want to complement that with uh, something in, on this end. And whenever I get lost in curves, uh, you just bear with me, please. It's, it's, uh, it's a very precise tool and I need to make sure that I, I don't go too far. So what I did here is just bringing a little more contrast. And now um, I want to go into the red channel and um, take uh, some, some, let's see, uh, some, some red off. Something like this. So what I'm doing is here in the three, what is that? Three, four, three quarter tones. Um, I'm just bringing in a little more green. And uh, in the blue channel, I want to bring in um, a little bit uh, blue in the, in the shadows. And it's hard to nail that uh, exactly. So just uh, let, me, let me move here. And uh, this one, I want to bring in a little more blue. Here, um, something like like this. So what I did now is I cooled off uh, the colors a bit so that we um, have a good base. And now um, I want to finish this with uh, the color editor. And um, I like the good old fashioned color palette that is here to to start um, playing with the colors. What I First thing Be I want to do Before you get that... to that, Jan, I just wanted yes. to throw um, <clears throat> a question at Arva based on the color grading. So let's bring Arva back. Um, Andres was asking, no, sorry, it was Martin was asking, uh, was the look of the color grading decided by Numero or was that that's something you two had free reign over? No, we, we decided how we want to finish the project. Nice, that's good. Um, and Andre was asking, was was this shot entirely with uh, natural light? Yes, completely. Yeah. Nice. Any reflectors or just? Uh, just no, uh, nothing. We didn't have any assistance with us, uh, so it just was dogs. really only the two models. Yeah, the, my dog. She's always my assistant. Um, we only had the two models. One makeup artist. She was doing hair and makeup. One stylist. Um, and uh, me and that's it Great. so it was really a little tiny team i like i prefer it a lot to work in tiny teams mm -hmm. of course you can see sometimes like here for example we didn't have a chance there on the, lo the location we can't park the car nearby so we had a long way uh, only uh, to walk mm -hmm. to the places where we can shoot so it was really um something we can't bring an iron with us so the all the clothing was of course uh, perfectly steamed before we <laughs> was outside of the car but after that you you see what is happening so after that it was a lot of work for jan um but finally to get this special light and to to get this feeling and also the boys was really into the idea of the lake so they really want to do it um and it brings so much more um passion into the pictures for all of the involved people so sometimes for me it's more important um to to really get this special um moments than having everything perfect because finally today we we have a chance i'm not a fan of the people who are saying we can do that later in post but on mm -hmm. the other hand um we we need to to learn to to take the chances we get yeah so it finally it don't need to be everything needs to be 100% perfect. It's more about to getting more the vibes and the perfect light. That's mm -hmm. more interesting than having everything around always on 1000%. Yes, definitely. Great. Okay, thanks for that, that little story for interrupting, but I thought that was a good time oh, to uh, have those. Oh, it was good. So, yeah, okay, to the, the color tool. Questions always welcome. Um, yes, the color tool is pretty powerful. And I uh, just want to show you what I want to do now. So I want to take down the, a little bit of the red yellowish um, tint in it and emphasize it uh, to bring it a little bit into more the monochrome greenish uh, tones. 
And that is by, um, for example, going to the reds and bringing down the saturation. If I go very far, that you could see that the sky, well, maybe you can't see it, but if I enhance it, you see that here is red in the sky. And I just want to bring it all off um, so that in print, um, the things are a little bit um, more even. And um, then the yellowish tones, because there's a lot of yellow in the in the uh, in the beach and also in the leaves and therefore i want to shift it a little bit more to the greenish end you can see what it does right it neutralizes the if i over exaggerate you can always say and i would encourage you to do so ju just play with the hue slider and see what the sliders do and uh, then you can find uh, the amount that works for you and uh, i want to take down the saturation quite a lot actually like 30-ish something, and um, it already neutralizes the, the floor and also the dress. And um, I think I want to finish this off with the greens. And the greens, I want to also notch it a bit. So I'm, I'm balancing out the, the transitions of the colors by bringing the green a bit to the yellow end and the yellow end a bit to the green end. And this is by shifting the, the hue. and um, Next thing I want to do is I want to take down the saturation of the of the greens as well, something around mid thirties as well. And by doing so, you can see that now the vivid colors are a bit more toned down and match, uh, make a perfect frame for the model. And this is what we wanted to achieve look wise. So this is a before and an after, and you can see that it's uh, much more balanced and has this moody, greenish, warm tones that we wanted. And there's one thing left to do, and that is create a new layer and um, just call it recover shadows, for example. I always, oh, not in brackets, not in capital letters, maybe. It's too loud. Recover shadows. And uh, what I want to do now is first, um, I always, fill the complete mask. So by pushing the button M, you can see that the mask is complete. And I want to show, I, I want to concentrate on the, the skin tones now or the, the details in the skin. And I want to open the shadows. And I uh, think we have a little whites to take off maybe here. So I want to balance the, the colors in the face a bit. And um, I want to open the, the blacks a bit. So something like that. And now I can uh, delete or clear the mask again. And I can use the brush on a fairly low opacity, maybe like 10-ish. And then I can brush my way to an amount that I like I can move in a bit further so that you can actually see what's happening. And by having this on a new layer, I have more control over uh, the things that I want to adjust. Let's see if I, oops, I think I painted a bit green on the jacket now. I can take that off and I can bring out the shadows here a bit more pushing m to hide the mask in this way we, we have a little bit more uh, shadow details and if it's too much i can use the opacity slider to tone it down a bit so that would be uh the master image for this one and, I have a um, question for you, Ian. Sorry. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Christian was asking, I guess this is personal preference as, as well, and I'm sure you do it sometimes. Why don't you use layers for the different tools, especially since you target the skin tones as, as well? So I guess the question is, all the base adjustments you did, they could go on a layer if you wanted to, but... Yes, true. Um, I, well, actually, um, if we go to the next editorial, I, I will do exactly that. Right. I wanted to show two approaches. Of course, I could have done that, but um, this wasn't a major um, shift in, in overall. So it was just playing a little bit with the 
mm-hmm. overall grades and color. So it was perfectly doable in, in on the background layer. But uh, Christian was it? Uh, it was. Yeah. Um, I think it was. It's an absolute valid point. So if you want to go into more detail, and uh, you can definitely do that. But in this case, I decided not to um, because they were all fairly similar. Mm-hmm. And I, what I can do now is just um, copy uh, the whole settings with Command Shift and C, or up here with the copy adjustment, and then I can go to the next image and I can paste it there and I uh, first I will turn this off and what I can do now is um, bring in a bit more exposure so I just have to adjust it ever so slightly and I can take down uh, some of the not the highlights but the whites in the in the sky and in the shirt to balance out what I what I have in the image and I can get fairly close with that um, to to match them, and uh, this is how I would proceed with all uh, the rest of the images to go from here to this. And um, yes, I think um, now that Christian asked for it, uh, we could switch to the yep. other editorial yes. if you if you like. Yep, definitely. And because there, it's uh, it's um, it's a more complex approach don't get scared it's just basically <laughs> it's just building more uh in in more control uh level layers and this is i think what uh, christian asks for and this is how i uh, love to work as well i love to have the complete control over mm-hmm. the images that i work on Fantastic. okay all right so uh, we, i would love need... to say uh, yeah, let's sorry. bring uh, Arva back. Sorry, I was just hunting for the right button. There we go. Yeah, no, what did you want sorry. to say? <laughs> uh, I would love to say one one small thing before we left this story. Mm-hmm. Um, because we was talking how important the teamwork is for all of us, uh, especially for Jan and uh, for me. Uh, we have a special way to work now. Um, and for me also really brings a lot of new special parts. We will talk in the next story about it. Um, it makes my work um, sometimes much lighter. I don't have to carry so much. Um, but here I want to say a big thank you to um, the stylist because he done such an amazing job. Uh, it was a bit van Carvos and uh, I don't want to miss to say thank you to him for this great job. Mm-hmm. Now we can yes. go over to the next story. Oh, before that, there's a good good question uh, based on collaboration and Martin was asking, just move that so it can fit in. Is there a way to transfer an edited RAW file to another PC? Yes, there is. And it's something which Jan does all the time so that someone else can continue working on it. Um, so basically you want to export as an EIP file, which is a format it's, you can capture. It's, a, it's already yeah. here, as you can see. Um, yeah, so, so the, yes. there. So if it's... I will unpack it quickly so uh, so that we can show the the process. Mm-hmm. But basically, what David just said is um, you have the option to turn that raw file, including um, all the settings that were just made, um, to have it all compact in one file, and that is by hitting the control button and uh, clicking the uh, thumbnail and pack as EIP. We were always wondering what EIP stands for, but I leave that. That was an enhanced image, uh, package, I believe. Package, yeah. yes. So yeah, you can do the right-click packers EIP in a session. If you're in a catalog, you can also say file export. Uh, I can't remember the terminology. Hang on, file export export. I'll show you in my screen in a second. So okay. hang on, by the power of, I should be able to bring up my screen, looks slightly different, sorry. Um, but uh, file export, export original files, and then you can say uh, pack as EIP right there. So this checkbox. So that means, you know, that will do a similar thing to, well, exactly the same thing Yam was showing, but if you're in a catalog, uh, that, that also works. So yes, you can yeah. do it. And, yeah. and one of the main benefits of using EIP files is A, you have the settings that the photographer, in this case, Ava has mm-hmm. maybe have, uh, has had on, on set, because mm-hmm. sometimes clients are on the set and you maybe agree on a certain look or at least a direction. And therefore, you can pack the ARP file and send it over to your retouch artist or um, 
or you have the option to, of course, send the whole session and all raw files, but sometimes it's not necessary because some shootings are huge mm -hmm. and hundreds or thousands of pictures, and maybe you just don't need all of them, but maybe a little like, tinier uh, selection of images. And then it does make sense to you know, just pack them as ERP files because then I can create a new session and I can just load them in and um, have all the settings I need. Mm -hmm. And in a similar kind of question, uh, can you export an edited raw file as a DNG to another editor? No, you cannot. So you can export a DNG, um, but it won't have any edits in it. Um, no two raw converters are the same. There's no universal raw converter language, if you like. So, And you can see that for yourself. If you take the same raw file and put it in Capture One, Lightroom, DxO, Luminar, um, others, then they're not going to look the same. And then just because one slider is called contrast in one application, it doesn't necessarily do or have the same effect in a different application. So those kinds of adjustments don't translate between uh, uh, different applications. So there we go. So what's next, Jan? Yes, mm -hmm. let's switch to uh, the second editorial. And, and I'll bring was, uh, uh, Harvard back yes. so she can tell us uh, about this one as well. Yes, please. In the spooky abandoned house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it was like this. Um, yeah, this one was for <laughs> Faces magazine. Um, normally, it would be really a tricky challenge for me because it mm -hmm. was inside. It was only the available light. Um, there was not no electricity and only one room still mm -hmm. left. And you can also see here on some pictures <laughs> that everything is cut off the walls. Um, yeah, and so it was really um, a special task before, because on the one hand, I um, was knowing that we need it for print. And on the other hand, I want also to show the architecture from the house. And it was really the last chance to shoot inside because the house <laughs> is sold. Um, so I didn't have a second chance. We only had a half day. Um, a lot of outfits um, mm. and it's always with, with the female models it takes a lot of time to, to change everything and this one she's amazing Merle she's really fast and so enthusiastic and she really want to do it so it was really a nice day um, yeah and so we, we had a day only we was only um, four women <laughs> team at this day um, so no, no assistant, uh, no extra light, no extra bounces or something. It was really only uh, my stylist, Isabella Makosh, uh, at this day, and um, our makeup artist, and uh, she was doing makeup and hair, Latisha. And yeah, it was me and uh, the model, Merle. And uh, that's it. And we had, sometimes it was a little bit um, spooky <laughs> <laughs> into the evening yes. in this really, really huge empty house um but it was a lot of fun and uh, i had the the challenge to also show a little bit of the architecture so i didn't have the chance always to find the perfect light spot for the model mm -hmm. sometimes it was then more to telling a story about the placement of the model than maybe having the perfect light um, but I was safe because I know Jan was doing the story later on, so he can save a lot with Capture One later to have both aspects to show the, the amazing architecture from the house and on the other hand um, to bring a good light back into the pictures. Yeah. So sometimes I was really on the hunt for the per perfect lightning for the model and on other pictures I was more on the hunt for, for the perfect um, moment where she can stand to really show a little bit more from the house. Mm -hmm. and, I, yeah. and I remember you saying yesterday that this was your last chance to shoot here as well because it was, yes. it was being sold. So it was important to pack as much in as, as possible. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it was really, and we, we had, I think, 11 or 12 outfits. So it was a big challenge for only a half day yeah. um, to get it done and don't have helping hands around. Of course, the dog was with us, with <laughs> our feeling a little bit safe. But maybe I need to say that she's now near to 14 years old, so a dog <laughs> granny. So I was not sure if she can hold up some monsters or something. But uh, finally, we, we made it through the day. Mm -hmm. um, no, it was really a really amazing location. 
Is it a location you found or, or the, the client found? Um, no, no, the, I um, know the uh, house owner and uh, I did ask him if, because we had rain for the shooting. We planned an out, outdoor shooting for this uh, as well. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we had the whole week raining. And when you have ordered 11 outfits from high end designers, um, you can see here Chanel and MS and so on. So we, we only have this one or two days chance to work for the editorial because then we need to send back the uh, PR samples. Um, mm -hmm. So we need to find another idea location. And so I remember that he told me he sold his house. So I did ask if we can maybe use it one last time. Um, so yes, we get the chance to, to work there. Fantastic. All right. So um... Back to Yan again, so a slightly different approach for, for this one. Yes, absolutely. It's a bit different. And Ava and me, we agreed on, um, on, a, on a very warm and very moody look for this editor because we wanted to emphasize what she found when, while on location. So uh, we wanted to bring that to life. And uh, as you can see, um, first of all, um, I, I wanted to add that um, for me, it's very important that Ava can be very creative and playful while she's there and that she knows that we can, um, even if there's some challenges, like for example, here, there's some, some are a bit more reddish, some are a bit more uh, greenish, and that is uh, no problem because we have the tools to, to um, balance this out again. And I want her to have all the complete creative freedom to capture the moment and therefore I'm I'm here to give peace of mind <laughs> and that is uh, what we uh, have found as a, as a very good base to collaborate closely and um, that being said um, I want to start again with the master um, which in this case was this one and um, so as I said uh, this time we will create um, let me find my layers I always have the layers outside because I want to see what I do and um, be, be quick with uh, adjustments. And um, again, like in the last one, um, I first work on the on the um, white balance, the color temperature, and I want to bump that up to something like well, I like round numbers, so six two hundred, and um, this is fine, like zero four maybe. Let's try. Oh no, let no zero four zero five is fine because I don't want it too reddish, and um, I want to put the exposure just up a notch, maybe to zero point two. Let's see. Yes, and what I will do now is the same as in the in the other one that I just previously showed. I want to first balance out luminosity after setting the the white balance and. It, um, it will be built in, in three layers. So the background layer, then there will be a color grade and contrast layer, and then there will be an additional um, color tint layer. So to reveal that already now, so that you see uh, know that it's going to be built up. And um, I want to take down saturation a bit, or maybe we can also do that later, but I, I know already where I want to go, so I can already do it. And uh, high dynamic range is again uh, a key part of this. So I want to take down the highlights. I want to open the the shadows. I want to take down the the light, the white. Sorry. This is just the the dress because we want it to be uh, this this moody, not too. Uh, not too um, contrasty in, in, in this stage. The contrast will be added a bit later. Uh, I love to add uh, the contrast with curves in individual channels. And uh, here I want to open the, the shadows a bit so that the dress is a little more visible. So having something like that. And now I want to work with the curves and bring in uh, some, some more uh, contrast. So something like this, an S-curve. Yes, like this. And by doing this, um, it adds in the RGB, it adds the contrast in the, 
in the uh, in all the channels as well and um, the this would be the the base on the background so i didn't touch the individual channels now so this is what i want to have as a base to move on from there so we'll create a next uh, layer and call it uh, color grade plus contrast and i'm going to fill the mask so that we have the whole canvas again and what i want to do now is um is kind of the similar approach like in the previous one i want to go into the individual channels and uh, sometimes uh, when i work with curves i um i drag them out and i enlarge the the window so that i have a bit more control because the, the curves are pretty powerful when you do tiny moves and this way i have more control I'm so glad you did that, Yang, because there was a question that I answered just in, in text in the background about someone, uh, sorry, I can't remember their name, I'd have to find it, but whoever asked, uh, here's how to do it. Because the question was, you know, the, the curves are quite sensitive, wouldn't it be good if, and here you go, you can do this, and that does, yep, give you a bit more fine control. You can even use your cursor keys to nudge a point should you want, you know, a tiny amount. So thanks, Yang, you read, read our minds. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, but I have the same, uh, you know, I have the same uh, feeling all the time. It's it's very good to uh, have control, and um, these windows can be tiny, even if, especially when you work on on a laptop or a tinier screen, um, it is very handy to drag them out and just enlarge them a lot. I also do that with the color balance tools uh, quite often, so you can make them really big, <laughs> and sometimes it it helps uh, to play with it in a larger scale. Anyhow, um, so I want to bring in a slightly different contrast in every channel. And that allows me to be um, very flexible with uh, the color um, that I want to bring into the image. And um, I know that this is an approach that not everybody uses, but I, a couple of years ago, fell in love with this. And I, I love to play with the the colors and bring in some for example here in this case green into the into the highlights or into the quarter tones and counter it with a little uh reddish uh in the in the um in the dark quarter tones and do the same with all the other channels and it's it's a very um intuitive approach and of course you have to get used to curves a bit and you have to know what it does so that if you work with the green curve and you put it down it, it turns into red and the other way around and um this, this is uh, important to know, but once you know your tools, you can um, break all the rules and play with it. And uh, this is what I uh, definitely would encourage you to try, or at least give it a try. And the blue one, and this is going to be, um, actually, I, it's really good to work with the, the cursor uh, keys. Is it cursor keys? Or, What's that called again? The yeah, keyboard, keyboard keys. keys. Yeah, <laughs> keyboard keys. arrows, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can be very precise, and you can, or you can have a look at the image, and um, then you can see what it does. So this neutralizes the the the, the lights slightly, and um, I think this is. I will show you the full image. This is where I wanted to go with that, and. The next edit uh, that I would uh, still do on the color grade uh, layer, and you can see that it brings in color contrast, right? So we, we are getting closer to that warm, moody look that we were looking for. And uh, the next thing is uh, working with uh, the, the oranges. And the oranges, I just, if you, if you see what, what happens when I bump up the the, uh, the saturation, I just want to boost it a bit so that I want to have that uh, saturation punch, but not too much, um, maybe like so. And the yellows, and I want to decrease the saturation of the yellows a bit because it's a bit too much, like so. And um, now with this second layer, we have uh, the option to, of course, use the opacity sliders to um, play with the uh, intensity of the grade, but as I was not 
completely done yet. I want to add a next layer because I wanted to play with um, a little, now that we have that orange, I wanted to complement that with a bit of teal color. So the greenish, uh, greenish color. Um, and I wanted to give it a little color tint and therefore I um, will fill the mask again and again um, use the curves and I want to um, just work with the highlights and I uh, want to bring down the, the red a bit to introduce uh, cyan. I want to bring in a little green in the highlights and uh, some some yellow here. So it's just five points each and that gives us that greenish tint. Let me put that back and um, we could then, but that's an optional step, uh, maybe reduce the, the saturation of the tint a tiny bit like so, so that it's not that super vivid. But uh, what this gives us, I don't know if you can actually see this. It's a, it's a very subtle change, but you let me know uh, if you can see that. Yeah, we can see it. Yep. All right. And um, then it's, it's fair to, um, especially with keeping in mind that I want to adjust the other images, uh, it's very handy to have that on a on a on the next layer. So maybe something like 40, 45, 40 percent would be a good amount for the color tint. And uh, that would be uh, before and after of of that look. And um, now with uh, the new version of Capture One, um, it is really handy to now be able to save that because I'm a big fan of saving color grades or saving um, raw developments that I created as presets to have somewhat like a starting point for other series. I have a huge collection of styles and by having those, I love to play with these in the beginning or when we, we sit down and we play with some um, settings that we had in previous shoots and we just bounce it and play with it. And this is a good way to see uh, like, what could be a direction that we want to take that and quickly um, make our way through this. And uh, therefore I want to save this um, also as a style with, uh, with um, what is it called? Say style layers, layers with styles. I can't, it's a new name. I have to layers check. With styles, um, yeah. no, layers with styles. Yeah. No, styles with styles. With there layers. we go. Styles with layers. <laughs> See, it's not that easy. <laughs> Both works. <Yeah. laughs> And uh, therefore you can go here and save a custom style. And you see that it includes the layers now. And I definitely want to do that. The, um, now that I worked with uh, a complete mask, like I filled the whole canvas, it will be transported, right, David? And if I would have had a, a separate or a, a tiny mask that I would have possibly created for skin or mm -hmm. uh, the dress, this would be, um, completely deactivated. Yeah, that's right. right. So so uh, maybe we should point that out. Yes. Yeah, a full mask can be saved. So a filled mask, um, no mask can be saved, but a partial mask can't because it's not possible to I mean, currently, maybe in the future, because if you think about uh, the way the mask data is is stored, um, let's say you wanted to let's say this was a this is a shot on Nikon, I think. So let's say this was a 24 megapixel Nikon, and then you applied that style to a 60 megapixel Nikon, Sony, whatever, doesn't matter. Um, then the way the Mars data is held currently, it cannot then extrapolate to a different pixel dimensions. So that's the reason why um, the partial mask can't be saved into a style. Um, the only way yes. around that would be to change completely how we store mask data, which isn't impossible. Um, but right now, generally, if you have done a partial mask, partial masks don't necessarily fit perfectly between different images, different poses anyway. Um, but a filled mask is very useful, an empty mask is useful. And of course, it's then easy to recreate the mask as you need to. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, very much. So um, let's just jump for uh, one example, like to, to the next image. And if we go here, or maybe I have to just do that and um, maybe take this layer off. It was a relict. Uh, and now we can apply this style by um, 
where is it custom styles now there no there it is right so we can bring this over and now to to match the other one i like to put them next to each other and um, we can see that this one uh, possibly could use uh, a bit more luminosity so i love to uh, also work with the luma curve because it keeps the colors uh, that I have in the background or the contrast, uh, the, uh, the, the, sorry, the color contrast, and I can just use the luminosity contrast to, um, to lighten up the image slightly, or maybe just you know, lighten the darks a bit and keep the midtones fairly where they were. So it's, it's an easy adjustment. And um, if this were, for example, be a little too green, I could uh, maybe take down the, the tint a bit that I have. So I can make use of the, of the different layers that I created and mix or match them pretty fast. Maybe we can do one more and uh, go to that one and apply the, the same style. And then again, I go back to have them all next to each other. And here you can see um, that it actually could use a little more of the, the greenish tint. So I can boost that up or I can go to the background. And in this case, maybe take down the, the lumin luminosity a bit, to darken it slightly or bring in a, a little bit more contrast. And this is how I usually match um, images in a series if I have one master grade. And um, just to give you an overview, maybe we can take Ava back uh, so that we can talk about how we do that. Um, what Ava and me like to do is uh, every now and then we, um, you know, we sit down together, even if we are not in the same uh, location, we then uh, have a connection through uh, a video call and we, um, we bounce ideas and thoughts and we, we tweak it and then um, so we, we are very fast in moving, uh, creating these looks and agreeing on, hey, let's try this and try a new version and uh, so that we are um, super flexible and easy to you know, send a, a good mood to the client and then or to the magazine and agree on um, that in, in a very fast manner. Because if I do uh, an adjustment like that uh, and we commit to this, we want to have the, um, the, the goal from the magazine that this is the, the look that we are aiming for and then start the retouching process uh, later on. So to have, a, have an agreement and have a base. And this is a, a way that we love to work. And yes, Ava, yeah. so um, just wanted to keep you in the loop here mm -hmm. and uh, give your thoughts on that series and how, the, how we created the look and everything. Yeah, for maybe for, for everybody who's watching first about the, uh, the look here, um, I was really sad when I was coming home and uh, looking at my pictures first because I remembered the, the location on a really, I was there on days before with amazing light outside and it was really moody inside and warm. And on this day, I told you in, in the beginning of this session that it was raining a lot outside, so we need to find an indoor spot. and I. Was I uh, didn't have an idea how dark it would be inside, and that all the nice, warm atmosphere is not there when there is so much rain outside in this location. Um, so, and I told about it to Jan, um, and then he was, "Oh, no problem, I can manage it." Um, and he found this warm look, and this is sometimes really cool when you only can. Um, bring your thoughts about everything inside. So uh, that you have the relationship that you really can talk um, openly about it when you are not so happy, what maybe didn't work so well for you. Mostly you can't do that with, with the most of the uh, team members. And so for me, it um, is now a really most important part in my work to find team members I always can talk openly about everything. So if I think um, something is not so good, I can bring this ball inside the game. Um, and I know there's another player who take this ball from me and can say, no problem, I will manage it. Um, so, and the other hand is um, how Jan explained how we are now working. It's so interesting for me as photographer. Before, of course, I was working with really good retouchers as well, but a lot of my, um, 
magazine work, I was retouching on my own. Um, so I was always on the hunt for the perfect picture inside of my camera. I'm also coming from analog photography. So it was really, always, I was really stuck in my brain with, I need to have the perfect picture directly in my camera. And now with, with seeing Jan working, especially with Capture One and all the possibilities in bringing light a little bit back or getting out of it or lighting up the shadows and getting so nice effects in the uh, contrast and the color contrast and so on. It's so much easier for me to to concentrate me on the day where I'm photographing, really on focusing on the team that everybody's happy, that the model is always in a good mood. We are photographers sometimes a little bit like circus directors, so we need to have everybody around us um, in a good mood, and the clown need to be there sometimes too, and mostly you need to be the clown on yourself. So it's not always easy to have everything on a raw <laughs> on, in this moment. And now I always can focus so much more on the important things because this was the start of winter, it was really cold, the model had this thin clothing, so I could focus completely on her um, because I was knowing that somebody is in my back and holding it for me um, later with the post-production. Um, I think it's important for young photographers to, to deep going deep inside what's possible with your RAWs later in the prose production. I never, uh, well, well, maybe before, I didn't know how much is possible because I was always on the hunt for the perfect picture. picture. Mm -hmm. I was not open to new styles and colors and so on. Um, and now with this also seeing it really live, how Jan is working with my pictures, um, I'm much more open-minded. Now I'm starting um, a shooting and have an idea about the color concept for later, but before it was not visual for me what's really possible. Yeah, so that's maybe one important part to to always also take maybe some of your shots you are not so happy with them mm -hmm. and give them a chance because sometimes the nicest things can coming out of this. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, we've got about five minutes left, so I'm just going to pull out uh, a couple of questions. Um, this is a photographic question from Tobias, so directed at, at Arva. Um, more of a photographic question, he begins. Where do you get inspiration for editorial shootings like this one from? So your source um, of inspiration. So I'm I'm always on the hunt for inspirations. Um, of course, I'm looking at the classical parts like models.com and go see and whatever we have there to to find amazing um, inspiration parts. Um, f especially for this editorial, I never had any um, external <laughs> inspiration source. I was really going there. I had in mind when I saw the house the first time and was really impressed from, from the staircase and everything from the house. And we need to see, because I was in the house when there was living people inside um, the last time before we had the, the shooting day there. So I need to use what was there. Like the sofa, there was only the, the really broken sofa thing left so we need to work with what we found so i can't use any inspiration um but normally i'm really i'm seeing um inspiration everywhere so for example when i'm going with my dogs and my kids into the wood um they're bringing me some some uh, plants and saying oh that's for next beauty shooting and sometimes i'm thinking oh what they're planning now and then i'm looking at, at the things my kids are bringing me and it's so interesting sometimes with the colors and um, the texture of things and you always can modify it or when we are cooking a lot um, it's also when we are cooking and when i'm cooking with the kids um, they have a lot of ideas what we can do and we use a lot of the ideas from the kids in some of the beauty shootings so you can find inspiration really everywhere. So I try not to find too many um, inspirations from other photographers because you can find yourself really fast into copy and paste um, things. Fantastic, great answer. Um, okay, question for Yan, uh, which, where was it? It was two questions on a similar, similar vein. 
which now I can't find it. So uh, Kelly, I think, no, V Kelly, was adding to another question by Kat. Um, so for touching up skin textures, do you do anything in Capture One or is that all, all then focused on Photoshop? Well, it depends. Um, actually, um, most of the time I'd say that happens in Photoshop, but you, um, it depends. But is it if it's just a you know a tiny imperfection and the the, uh, the skin is rather flawless uh, aside from that I fix that in, in Capture One mm -hmm. using the um, tools that are there like the here um, the no what is that uh, the healing mask or yeah. remove spot or um, this is something that I use um, but the, to be fair I think the the most part of the, the retouching process um, is done in like healing and cloning or uh, dodging and burning is done in, in Photoshop on separate layers because then I can go back and I can, you know, sometimes it's, it's a good idea if you finish the cleanup process um, that you take back the, um, the opacity and that you see that you don't overdo it by, because Everybody, I think, everybody uh, <laughs> tends to fix things. And if you're in the zone, you maybe you go a little overboard. And it's always a good idea to, you know, take a step back from the image and um, reduce the opacity. And that I can't do when I'm in, in uh, Capture One and commit to the raw conversion. So I, I, of course, I can work with layers and dodge and burn there. I do that too. But um, I want to keep the flexibility when it gets into the micro fixes. Perfect. Sorry for just plunging into darkness for a second. I've uh, uh, trusted the um, battery readout on my light uh, too much and it just died, even though it said it had two hours left. So I've just turned up another light, So, but the color balance is off. So sorry about that. You're looking <laughs> good, David. You're looking good, as always. <laughs> um, there was quite a few questions, um, philosophical questions on color and a few other things which uh, either of you can answer. I guess the more technical question is, how do you know the magazine is going to faithfully represent your color grading? I guess you don't. It's a, it's a hope, I suppose. Um, but I, but what's your experience of working with magazines now? Are they, are they pretty good at nailing the color representation? Well, most of the times I'd say mm -hmm. yes, uh, because uh, we try to not do like go overboard. Right. Um, and um, but uh, yes, if you have got very saturated colors or if you have got um, like colors that go a little at the edge of the color space, uh, the printable space, you need to be a little cautious yep. and maybe ask for a proof if that's possible and or proof the images yourself like a print proof. Mm -hmm. And then you can make sure that there are no surprises in, in print. And I'd recommend doing that, Excellent. at least discussing that. Yeah, <laughs> and I, th I think print printing processes have got a lot more advanced and, uh, and a lot more. Yeah, reliable, the, the, so. the, the ribs, um, yeah. the ribs of the printing machines, they do a fairly good job in converting colors. So yeah. um, but that being said, uh, a very good idea is to always deliver, uh, believe me, from experience, always deliver the uh, files in RGB. Mm -hmm. to the to the magazine or to the printer mm -hmm. and let them do the conversion to uh, with their ribs yep. with their ribs in in to cmyk because mm -hmm. they know uh, the exact profile for the magazine and they have their experiences with their magazine and they can mm -hmm. nail it much more than you would be able to soft prove it or you know and just one way to avoid challenges and then the more philosophical question i guess was in terms of this, this is clothing, so, and um, I think my answer to this is, you know, photography for e-commerce, for me going onto a clothing site and buying clothes is very different to, you know, an editorial shoot. So you're less concerned here about clothing color accuracy, I would assume, um, as opposed to a creative color grade. Is that, is that a fair conclusion on my side? Absolutely. Um, I would say, of course, when you're working for a fashion client, it's complete another thing Then you really need to be perfect with the mm -hmm. color range of the clothings um, and really exact on the, the 
real realistic point but when you're shooting an editorial it's it's more feeling you're selling with your pictures yeah it's it's not the exact color range of the clothings yes exactly. and uh in in this case um i i'd like to add ava was telling um you and also me while she was uh coming back from the shoe that she had that feeling there uh like this moody feeling and this is what i love to like I love to listen to what the photographer sees in the images and then come up with a grading idea and bounce that back and forth because she has been there. She knows uh, how it felt and that could underline or match or even enhance the, the mood that was there. And this is, uh, the ex this is the result of that. Fantastic. Um... The final question, it's, it always comes up a few times and again on, on colour, people seem to be a little bit obsessed with um, shooting colour checkers. <laughs> and I very actually rarely see uh, outside of maybe product photography, perhaps, um, where you're looking to nail a very specific colour or in e-commerce, I very rarely see at people actually shooting colour checker cards. Um, uh so when you're shooting fashion for clients, then mm -hmm. it's really fast. Yep. Um, and later you you really get in a lot of trouble when you don't do it. Right. <laughs> um, but you are really, um, I don't want to say too Berlinish, but maybe you really can save your ass <laughs> when yeah. you are really use it for every single outfit. But yeah. for an editorial, I need to say I never used one for mm -hmm. an editorial. Um, normally, I always um, have one in my camera backpack mm -hmm. um, and can be safe because sometimes you know this dress is going on a cover right. and then you maybe need to be safe because then the PR agency will really let your head roll when you don't <laughs> make safe that, that the colors from a really important colorful dress um, is getting in another color scheme. And then you're also later, the researcher has it so much easier to make a color concept around it because you can um, bring the colors from the dress back to the original colors. Got it. Um, but here, for example, we didn't have really colorful dresses or something where it would be maybe a big problem mm -hmm. because finally you can see it's a black dress and it's a white dress so it's it's not a big thing when they're no. getting a moody color as well and it's an editorial story so it's uh, yes yeah, absolutely less important well fantastic um i've put your both of your respective websites in the in the different chats so people know uh where to find you as well and, and where to follow you um as always jan thanks for your insights into capture one and color grading and uh you're most welcome <laughs> and over to you yes. for joining us when you're not feeling your best thank you <laughs> and we and both of us got through it without you know coughing and uh, and upsetting Jan. so uh so that's always a, oh. a, a Yay. bonus. Yay. <laughs> yes, and nobody had to count the coughs. There was no one. No, we, we were thinking about doing a cough counter, but, but fortunately, we didn't have to, so we got through it. So we have two winners. <laughs> two winners, today. yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> so Amazing. in the practical side of it, that's it for live streams this year for Capture One, but we're back um, early January, and you can always find those on learn.captureone.com, or you can see them scheduled on YouTube as well if you find our YouTube channel. Um, so if you search for Capture One on YouTube, it will, it will come up easily, and you can always see them there. So enjoy your time off, uh, whatever holiday you're celebrating over the next uh, couple of weeks. I hope you have a good one. Uh, I'm off to Canada. Uh, tomorrow so uh, even more oh, snow wow. there hopefully yeah so uh, enjoy your Christmas uh, New Year's and everything and we hope to see you again soon so thanks Jan and thanks Ava once more as well thank, thank you, you David for and having us thank, uh, a, pleasure, a pleasure thank everybody for watching and a great holiday season to everyone yep. and uh, let's let's uh, find the next one next year then definitely let's yes. do it. <laughs> right take care everyone bye have right. a nice holidays bye bye <laughs> bye, bye.